नमस्ते हैप्पी लोरी हैप्पी मकर संक्रांति हैप्पी पोंगल एंड हैप्पी बर्थडे सर व्हाट एन ऑस्पेशियस डे टू मीट एंड टुडे द टॉपिक दैट आई हैव बीन ब्लेस्ड टू टॉक अबाउट इज ऑन इंटेग्रल योगा एंड रिलेशनशिप्स family and as i was sitting here i reflected that in a way i am talking to my spiritual family and i left my biological family maybe an hour back to come here and speak and um, it is these different relationships that color our life that challenge our life and at least for me it is these very beautiful relationships that put me on the path of integral yoga so what i'm sharing today is an offering it's an offering mostly from an experiential perspective which i found became far more divine far more fruitful far more connected with the soul when i came across the philosophy of integral yoga so that's how the dots got connected for me and uh, like anybody yoga was a bunch of asanas for me it took me a long time to understand integral yoga wherein we talk about the different parts of a being and we start with saying there is the physical self which is you know how we are how we look our own physical bodies and then there is the vital self which is basically all our emotions our feelings our passion it's very powerful it's in a way what is probably the binding force for many relationships and then we being humans we also have a hugely developed mental which means we think we process we reflect and we think through a lot of these things and we feel that if we are able to think rationalize then we are evolved we are educated we know the truth and that is so far from the truth because thoughts the truth is the thoughts don't even belong to us they've been implanted as we grow up through our society through our conditioning things about what is right or what is wrong they become part of our thoughts what is the way to connect with somebody in a relationship is again a thought part of our conditioning and as we process we realize that this mental faculty while it is great it doesn't allow us to really nurture ourselves and the people around us we are caught in this dilemma of overthinking overfeeding and so many times it is this interplay of forces between the vital and the mental or even you know and us trying to be very very striving for our own physical survival or surface being so a large part of my life and maybe a large part of many other people's life because that's how the world is today is these surface interactions who's giving who to what uh, how much transaction is happening if i offer this then am i getting the same approximately or more is this friend calling me each time they have a get together or am i being given the pass and there is a mental calculation and our relationships then are based on this mental calculation and our vital 
it's a force it's powerful and yet it doesn't help us grow why because we are very focused on our boundaries my thoughts my being my physical possessions what is it that i have do i feel bad if i have not invited somewhere do i feel bad if somebody says a slightly rude word to me what happens my ego gets hurt so even with a husband and wife two equal friends boss and subordinate colleagues neighbors you talk of any relationship there is this constant force of the ego which is happening and that happens and if you look at any relationship which is becoming very difficult you will find that the that the mental the vital and the ego are the dominant forces i'll explain because this has been my understanding so what happens in integral yoga we try to go deeper we try to connect with our deeper soul we try to have a connect with our psychic turn away from the surface turn away from the everyday manipulations or calculations of relationships and life and start understanding or at least somewhere believing that there is a reason i'm here and it can't be i have earned so much or we have so many children or our children are married to such good families or that we have so many friends or we have so many social engagements my social calendar is full it doesn't enrich us at a certain point and even when you see people who look very happy and in my practice as a psychologist or counselor you pick up the sheet and you don't need to because they've come with a problem and the packaging is beautiful what's inside is breaking and integral yoga helps us turn within it helps us turn towards the divine it helps us understand that we are actually souls with a physical being on a journey and we are on a journey wherein we are trying to increase or expand or become more open to divine forces and our consciousness and it all sounds like theory and you're like wow really there's a psychic being does it exist so the mother says in many books one of them is the words of long ago she says we are on earth to progress this is the reason for taking birth repeatedly because a psychic be because a psychic being can only progress in contact with the earth come more to the foreground and make our thoughts more psychic let's look at this did we ever know this as children were we ever taught this in school so we forgotten or we never knew that this is the reason why we've come here to grow our souls so if we've chosen to grow our souls and the earth is the place that we can grow then the people who are there in our life are the catalysts for our spiritual growth that's how they come to us and all the interactions experiences challenges everything that we face are for us to take our soul further on that journey and yes the path has sometimes a lot of pain there is this statement that pain is the hammer of the gods because you see we have this very tough exterior so many years of conditioning which doesn't tell us anything about the soul so many years of education that doesn't help us look within 
So if we were to look at it from a perspective of integral yoga, then every relationship, every encounter, every communication is an opportunity for us to go deeper and understand our psychic, understand that there is a reason possibly that this is happening. And that reason is our catalyst for growth. If we are here on a cold, foggy morning, and deep gratitude for coming here, then I'm assuming we want to bring warmth to our relationships. So let me narrate a small example, and I'm going to pick a couple of everyday examples or challenges, and then we'll talk as we proceed. So I was working with a 20, 21-year-old young adult who is studying, studying um, abroad. The parents have spent a lot of money uh, for his undergraduate degree. And uh, there is a lot of conflict or challenge in the relationship between the parent and the adult, now a young adult. Uh, the reasons for the conflict as per the parent is that this young adult is not taking responsibility, not studying, not working towards the degree. There's so much money that has been spent. Doesn't, doesn't value the resources and time. And the young adult says, I'm never listened to. The courses and colleges are chosen for me. It's decided, I don't have a choice, I'm sent. I have to sit in that class, I have to make sure I get a certain grade because I have to do the next postgraduate degree and for that I need this grade because if I do that postgraduate degree then my parents tell me that I will find a good job or that's what they think will be good for me. The parent tries to structure the time of the young adult who actually had fallen so sick that he had to come back home for a semester because of all this pressure to the last hour while they are at work. And the real, real cause for worry in that relationship is this is my son, what have I done wrong why isn't this person listening to me? I have 45 years of experience. Why isn't this person listening to me? And the son is saying, I just have to listen to them. They don't hear me at all. And when I try to express myself, it's a real fight at home. How do I connect to them? Here's a case wherein the vital or the feelings are challenged, impoverished. And if you really look at it, while the basis is love, wherein the parent really wants the young adult to do well, and the young adult also wants to do well, everybody wants to do well, it's a part of life. But the person wants to be listened to, they want their entity also to be respected. So you pick up a couple of other layers, you find that it is this it is this attachment of the parent to the thought that this is the path that will lead them to success. And I can't be wrong. Which in a way can translate to an ego conflict, if you put it in a different word. And it is this interaction between the vital and the mental. The mental are those thoughts, those conditioning, which the parent believes through their life that this is the way life is run. This is what you need to do. This is your checklist, this is your path. You do this, you become successful. And the adult says, but that's not true anymore in this world. I'm spending so much money, so much time, my entire youth. In 
in all situations, and I've given you a very typical parent, young adult example, because that's a lot of what I hear. If one were to just step back from the role of the parent, stepping back being a critical component of bringing yoga to our relationships. And knowing that, okay, these are my thoughts, this is my understanding, I have the best interests of my child, I'm feeling bad, that emotion is also valid. But can I just step back and see what is it that I am doing? And why is this happening? And if they were to do that step back consciously, repeatedly, and allow the young adult to bloom, because that's what they will need eventually. They can't monitor every hour of that person's life. It's not feasible, it's not practical, it's not good for that adult soul. That step back, if done willingly, voluntarily, and in that stepping back, if we can turn our head towards the divine, find solitude, find that peace where we can actually reflect and say, I want to know the truth. I don't have to be right. That's the first thing in a relationship. We don't have to be right, but we want to know the truth. Our sincere aspiration is for the divine truth. Then how powerful that relationship would become. And the mother says this a lot. I'm just quoting a little bit from conversations with the mother. And she says, the whole trouble arises out of your not being accustomed to stepping back. You must always step back into yourself. Learn to go deep within. Step back and you will be safe. If someone is angry with you, we all have experiences of someone being angry with us, us being angry with somebody too, right? So if someone is angry with you, do not be caught in his vibrations, but simply step back and his anger, finding no support or response will vanish. I experimented with this yesterday, I must confess. A very small everyday episode wherein I had to go to a shop and I had bought something and it costed me a few thousand rupees. And he told me as usual, there is no warranty ma'am, no guarantee, but this will run for at least six to eight months. And uh, it gave way in two days. <laughs> so I went back and I told him, now, so, I was of course with other family members and uh, one of them whose gadget it was, was very upset. And as usual, an altercation or a somewhat discussion, a heated discussion happens on how, how can you do this? And this is, this is not even a relationship which is of core importance. It's a shopkeeper, we are a customer, we don't have to go back to that shop. But see how heated that discussion can become. And somewhere they also said a few things about how, you know, that maybe we had broken that gadget purposely and we were not telling them. The situation blows up, right? And I said, okay, now let's just step back. There, of course, I couldn't do anything, but at home I said, for some time, let's not discuss this. I just want to do something else. We don't need to discuss this, we've already spent half an hour and a few thousand and two days of that thing not working very well. Did the gadget work? No. No miracle happened. <laughs> Did the house become more peaceful? Did everybody after a while just find other meaningful things to do? Yes. 
So I find that there's a lot of power in stepping back, finding solitude, and not getting caught in the traffic of life. And the way I churn this muscle is that I walk through the traffic of life and I say I will observe, but I will not become caught in it. And then every now and then, vigilance goes and I get caught. And then you go back because we are human. We make mistakes. Every now and then, we will get caught in this traffic. But the biggest thing I've found, if one wants to have a connection with the psychic, is to find time every day, if you can, in solitude. To reflect, to write, to maybe even think about the divine. And, you know, I don't so far have a great uh, affinity for very big words and very bo bo big books of spirituality. I'm not there. But what appealed to me was this book, Psychic Education, a workbook. It's beautiful. It has chapters on self-observation, purification, and how you can sit down, small, small cues and questions and tips that allow you to just go within. Because when you nurture your soul, you can nurture other souls. Simple. When you go within and you truthfully decide to become that person and you see all your flaws, and oh my God, there are so many. But for that time, in that reflection, in that solitude, you're not justifying. Just saying, okay. Allow me, allow me to work through. And you've nourished your soul. You've become like your parent. You're parenting your own soul and you're seeking the divine presence. And if you can spend some time every day with that, then the magic in your relationships can start happening. And it happens because Every communication, every nuance, every statement, every response becomes different because you are not caught up in the physical, vital and mental. You are trying to go a level below or a level closer to your soul. And that's the beauty of integral yoga. It allows you to accept the physical aspects. It respects the ego boundaries. It respects that if we are here, we have this physical body, we have to protect it, we have to nurture it, we can't become self-sacrificial. It respects that we do need a vital force that binds families, that binds people. But the point is that the vital force needs to be educated. Pretty much the way, the example that comes to my mind is a parent who has two siblings and they are close in age, say maybe two years apart. Hmm? So the older one is used to all the love and then after a while the younger one also is born and demands and needs the love of the mother. There's always a charge in the house, <laughs> isn't it? There's a charge in the house and the older one might feel, oh my God, this is my mother. There is love for the younger sibling, but this is my mother. Why? Why is there? Why aren't I getting that attention? And what does the mother do? She lovingly helps the child grow into becoming the loving sibling, protecting his or her interests also and protecting the young one. I find that metaphor very good for the way we need to educate our vital. We love the fact that we do need to love ourselves, we do need to take care, but we do need to do it in an egoless or a selfless way so that we are giving also. And we are giving a lot because anyway, 
Like the mother says, our physical bodies are just an instrument. If we have a talent of singing, beautiful, the more she sings, the more we receive, the more joy we get, the more her talent is nurtured. Thank you so much. So the point is to give. The more knowledge somebody has and the more they share and the more they grow and learn, the more they gain knowledge. So then what is ours really? The physical becomes the instrument. Our skills become the instrument. So then one more layer of understanding starts sharpening that perhaps all this that I've been calling mine and feeling so I, I, I about it, It wasn't mine, it was given to me with the purpose of helping me grow my soul and this is a very collaborative effort because when you're in the presence of somebody who is very spiritual and grown their soul and I've had the good fortune of meeting such people and there is a magnetic pull or a force that starts acting on you and you start growing. So actually, it's wonderful if you have people who are ahead of you on the path. It's so helpful, so different from the competition that we think of. Collaboration is so helpful. The more the consciousness, the more the people are turning towards the psychic, the more there is giving. If everybody is giving, then we don't need to worry about survival, isn't it? And imagine if Many of us are able to think, feel, implement this yoga at a large scale. To the best of my understanding, I think that is the rising in consciousness that we are trying to achieve. And the more we work towards it, and we'll face a lot of struggles. Huh? Because currently, the mainstream world is not looking at that. So, it's like if you've been in a very crowded railway platform and you're trying to catch a train, and let's say the crowd is going like this, and you have to go like this because your psychic is directing you. Oh, wow. That's the pressure that you will sometimes face, and that's the dhakkam dhakka that you will sometimes face. But in that dhakkam dhakka, you become stronger. And the more connected you are with your psychic and with your faith, the more clearly you are able to step back and see things for what they are. Not what you want them to be. Not what everybody trained it to be for you. And it's a journey. I, I think it's a journey wherein one keeps oscillating. One of the things that I would like to kind of pause here with this and maybe ask for reflections. Sometimes we come across friendships, relationships, um, which are unhealthy, to use a very simple word, to use a more complex word, toxic, abusive. And we sometimes find that in some individuals, these relationships are very high in number. It's like a pattern. And that person is suffering, there's a lot of pain. So the mother says that a man may act in an inhuman way, but then he's not a true man. Quarrels and clashes are a proof of absence of the yogic poise. And those who seriously want to do yoga must learn to grow out of these things. It is easy enough not to clash when there is no cause for strife or dispute or quarrel. It is when there is cause and the other side is impossible and unreasonable that one gets the opportunity of rising above one's vital nature. 
I want us all to just pause if you feel the statement somewhere. Show the truth. And when we reflect, if we were to even see the model of the physical, vital, mental, a lot of our reflections are at the mental plane. So I'll quote further, in ordinary life, people always judge wrongly because they judge by mental standards and generally by conventional standards. The human mind is an instrument, not of truth, but of ignorance and error. The truth is just the key to the whole problem of transformation. Always keep in touch with the Divine Presence. Try to bring it down. And the very best will always take place. I'll pause here for any reflections, questions, sharing. If Dr. Bijlani would like to take it from here, anything. Somehow I had this strange feeling you would ask me this question. <laughs> <laughs> so before what the mother says, <laughs> anything that threatens physical security is not a place where one continues to suffer. I think that's something that we need to clarify. And a lot of spirituality seems to encourage suffering and so I want to clarify that first because you know things that threaten physical security are not places where we continue to suffer. Well what I remember of what she says is that when we are in difficult relationships and which are very unreasonable, very toxic, very abusive, what starts happening is that naturally we start hating the person we start really disliking the person we harbor a lot of negative thoughts about the person and we wonder why why me what did i do did i do anything to deserve this uh, i'm always trying to be nice in my worldview i've done everything that needed to be done this particular advice which the mother says is that if there is a possibility understand that everybody is a manifestation of the divine very hard when you're going through that pain hmm? and they are on their own path of yoga because every soul is here for their own transformation so if we have to look at the journey of the soul and if we were to look at, you know, animal to human, human to being, so an animal, the first few genomes as the human would have more animalistic tendencies, more aggression, untamed passion. 
And as the soul evolves through many births and rebirths and grows, the person becomes more human, understands what it is to be human. And a good human being, but may not have too many spiritual inclinations, but basically good human being. And then you have the human who's trying to aspire to get closer to their psychic or the divine. Now, if we were to just step back from being that person who is suffering there and see this journey and not try to plot ourselves on the graph because we don't know <laughs> where we are and it would be very arrogant to say, oh, I'm there. No, no, we don't know where we are. But there is a possibility that this soul is struggling to overcome certain tendencies. Possibility. And what is our task? How do we connect? How do we respond? Of course, we keep ourselves safe. We understand that this is their journey and through this pain, which is the hammer of the gods in my life or in your life or in whoever's life, it is your journey for the soul to transform. So either you take the challenge and turn to the divine, or you succumb to the pain. And when you take the challenge and you make the divine closer to your heart, you find a lot of energy, force, um, faith, ability to transcend those everyday, difficult, challenging, unreasonable interactions. But if we get stuck in why me, then our journey becomes longer, more painful. So, the other aspect is on thought. Very hard, but if we've been in a chronic or difficult relationship wherein a lot of criticism is, you know, told about us, a lot of gossip happens about us, then obviously there's a lot of negativity that we also carry or harbor. So then those moments of solitude to cleanse that negativity, because what is it doing inside you? It's only becoming a larger wound. Even more reason to connect with your own soul because the people around you are not giving you that energy. So moments of solitude, connecting with the divine force and from turning into this really hurricane filled with emotions, strife, pain and suffering to becoming more like the still water, which you can see through. And then you see things more clearly from where you are as well as from where somebody else may be. You see it for what it is and you're closer to the truth. And in that process, you've distanced yourself from the emotional pain and suffering. Just like when you walk physically away from a place, you distance yourself. It is there, the memory is there, you understand it, it's part of your past, but you have walked the path of yoga to distance yourself, to understand and know that, okay, this possibly was my catalyst for growth. And then to not hold ill intentions or ill feelings about the person, but to love them, if one can grow till that point, it's very tough, but to love them I mean, you don't really have to like them. 
but to know that they are also manifestations of the divine and to love them for that. Because if you really look deep, there wouldn't be a Bhagavad Gita if there weren't Kauravas. Sorry, yeah. There wouldn't be people trying to rise above, connect and do more transformation work if there wasn't another hostile set of forces pulling you in the opposite direction. So when you distance like that, you're like, okay, it's all a part of this game called life. And if you were to look at history, mythology, repeatedly, there will be people who play the role of the hostile force. Imagine what is their life. Just for a minute. Somebody who is very negative, imagine what is that person's life of very critical, very manipulative. It's a difficult life to lead. But that's part of their journey. And the truth is that we can get very arrogant, huh? And say, oh wow. <laughs> but people can really work on the spiritual path and really move forward. Sometimes in a very short span of time, after many years of suffering. Because the pull to transform is high. So, to stay connected with yourself, your soul, to respect your soul and your journey. To know there is a divine guide, light, and to hold that light close to your heart. To self-observe, introspect, reflect, and be forgiving about your mistakes, because we are all human but resolve to be back on the path. And to be, seek spiritual collaborators, gurus, where you find places like these, retreats. Because they give you a lot of fuel and energy to think, reflect, to feel. And then what happens is that vital, which is now filled either with very positive emotions for some people and very negative for the others, it starts getting a little lighter. There is a love, but it's not possessive. The friendships that have retained the test of time are not the ones who expect me to call them every day or every week. The ones who are unconditional, call when you can, we'll fix up a time, let's speak. There's no pressure in that relationship. There's only love. Same for all other family members, same for everywhere else, which means there is no possessiveness or insecurity that is fueling that. There is no negative effect that is fueling that. So what happens is that the love becomes deeper. It may not have the redness or the passion, but there is a deep, continuing, sustaining flame which fuels the relationship, which fuels the soul, which allows you to also stay on the path. And when you get out of your solitude, Sometimes it happens to me. I suddenly become this very angry person. And I'm like, what's the use? Go back. <laughs> what's the use? Because currently that's where we are. We 
we are in the humdrum of life, humdrum of stress, everyday stress. And then people start taking a one week, 10 day retreat. And they say, okay, this is peace, this is nirvana, there's no stress here. And they do asanas, detox, everything happens. And then they go back because they're not carrying that peace with them. They're not working on themselves. So if we can carry that peace, and how do we carry it? First, we have to sit in solitude ourselves a little bit. Yeah. There is this um, beautiful bhajan that Janavi sings. In very, um, maybe you will come and sing it later. In very difficult times, you might say, no, Basically says, Sansar se bhage firte ho, Bhagwan ko tum kya paoge. Ye bhog bhi ek tapasya hai, tum tyaag ke mare kahan jaoge. Essentially, we run away from the world and then we go back and reconnect because we need it for our physical survival. But isn't it, isn't every part of the world the divine creation? And all the forces are probably working towards that higher consciousness. And each of us has a role to play for us to awaken to that role and to try and do that, become that person. Knowing fully well that it's not you, it's not I. It's just part of the divine blessing that you have, which you need to give forward. Any other Thank you for the question. The question is that what if a child or a young adult is facing a difficult situation and how do you nurture the, the act of self-observation and reflection, especially when the environment doesn't show that, right? Well, in my experience, hmm, if the young adult has come seeking guidance, then they are possibly open and receptive at that point in time to see because they really want to remove that suffering in their life. The pain is intense enough. And when you talk and you understand the number of things that are bothering them, as a psychologist in the process of the conversations, they will have one or two aha insights. And that's a good place for then somebody to say, why don't you spend time a little bit on your own because our sessions are numbered, but you are your best friend. I'm gonna help you become your best friend or to parent yourself. We can't change your parents unless they want to change. Nobody can change anybody. And why don't you just pick up. So even small things like actually choosing a journal and sending it to them saying, do you want to buy this? So that's like a nudge. Asking them to probably journal or write or reflect and send you a tick saying, 
have you done it today and keeping a loving watch over it without any judgment attached and doing it continuously yourself because when you do it yourself you actually experience the benefits of it when you experience the benefits of it then only you are very authentic and you can speak from that faith about how one can steer away because this time it's parents tomorrow it'll be a boss next it'll be friends there will always be adverse forces in our so taking that time out initially you can suggest when they are open and receptive you can encourage it through simple reinforcements and practice it become that person so every now and then even sharing a reflection can trigger an insight and reflection in a whole lot of people around you actually yeah i, I hope that helps thank you i think i'll close yeah any others you want to say something thank you so much thank you so much everyone thank you thank you han ji please dr bijlani please come and add thank you shri vidya one of the key takeaways from uh, your session was uh, to be able to walk without actually walking <laughs> when we are in a toxic relationship uh, naturally one feels like distancing oneself and distancing sometimes physically that is walking away from there and in some situations that may be actually necessary to create that geographical distance but very often that is not really what is uh, absolutely essential so walking the path of yoga itself helps you walk away without actually physically walking and uh, how does that happen you are able to distance yourself without distancing yourself physically you become more of a spectator a witness and when you do that then uh, as you said i mean the best friend is actually within you you start discovering that friend within you and then when you start doing that then uh, it seems as if the universe conspires to also create those external conditions in which you will find some little spark somewhere maybe in something that you read maybe just one sentence or one uh, that you hear or uh, read somewhere that could act that that trigger which puts you on that uh, path which helps you further sort of be able to make use of this distancing without actually distancing you start seeing that uh, the other person is also a manifestation of the divine and uh, the difficulty that you had earlier starts disappearing because uh, now you are seeing that person in a different light and uh, you also find that uh, then the negativity of that person starts affecting you less and less because what happens is that uh, uh, initially you know you are more receptive to that now you start developing a spiritual armor or a spiritual shield that doesn't affect you and you start becoming more also aware of the fact that the other person starts changing because as if without actually uh, making any conscious effort on your part the other person is uh, catching those positive vibrations you know a small amount of positivity can overcome a large amount of negativity and that happens partly because of these positive vibrations that you create and uh, then you find the other person starts changing and it becomes less of a challenge to you to see the divine in the other person and uh, the also you re start realizing that uh, you are putting yourself at the center earlier you were feeling that uh, this person is doing this to me this person is doing that to me now you are not thinking about that because you know that uh, uh, you cannot control anybody else's behavior you cannot take the responsibility for anybody else's spiritual growth but what you can do is to uh, be happy independent of external circumstances now that realization when that realization comes then you find that uh, the best friend is within you the true source of happiness is within you and uh, 
that becomes a sort of that shield which protects you and at the same time uh, although you cannot really do anything for the other person in the sense that you cannot take responsibility for the other person's spiritual growth you cannot change the other person you cannot do it but the person starts changing and when the person changes then naturally that's a win-win situation uh, you have been able to take care of your, for yourself and you have been able to do something positive for the others because when we put ourselves at the center we are only thinking of what we are getting from that person the negativity now you are thinking that why should the flow be only that way if my positivity flowing to that person here's an opportunity to give so i'm giving something and giving is always in our own hands so you from the uh, position of being uh, uh, being in a position where you want something you realize that you have a capacity to give and that is always in your own hands and that itself is a source of great joy so you know the whole situation can change merely by walking the path of yoga walking without actually walking that's what i really enjoyed thank you